Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to the Leading Agile booth here at Agile 2018. It's very noisy. This is the big reception night. Peter Green's here. Thanks for coming, man. Shake my hand. What's up, Facebook? The Facebook, yes. And I'm super excited because I've been waiting to interview you about this topic for like a year and we've not connected on it. So, you've done, you did, you're doing the tomorrow. Is the tomorrow I'm doing a session, okay. yeah. And you've done that at Scrum Gatherings and other events in the past. I have. Okay, so the session is on the links between Agile and Jazz. And what, how do you connect those two things together? Well, my uh, background is in, as a musician. Okay. So I was a professional jazz trumpet player and okay. still am. I still do play, you know. Um, and so when I got into the software world uh, and started learning about Agile, I kind of realized I had some experience working in very collaborative, self-organizing, high-performing teams. Okay. Uh, you know, jazz groups, there's kind of two, two uh, ensemble sizes in jazz that are pretty okay. standard. One like a big band, which is like 16, 17 people. Right. And one is what they just call small group, like, like small group jazz. People. Yeah, and it's like as soon as you get beyond about six, it, it the vibe changes a little bit, right? Okay. It's not quite as loose and improvisatory, and it, it goes along with everything we know about team size, is that once you okay. get around six or seven, the rules have to change for it to okay. still work. It gets more structured. So what's your preference when you're playing? You know, I actually love both of them. I love okay. playing in an ensemble where it's about precision and blend, okay. and uh, you can have a really big, Sound, you know, with a big band. I just right. love the sound of a big band. But everybody's got to be really tight for it to sound exactly good. right. And and uh, only at the very top of the profession can that happen without rehearsal. Okay. It's true that that happens. If you look at you know like guys that are playing in the studios in L.A. or New York City, right. uh, those guys sit down and they're literally sight reading, and it sounds like they've been rehearsing it together for 20 years. You know, if you listen to like uh, the the latest Incredibles movie, right? Uh, the Incredibles 2. Uh, that was all sight read. Wow. And those guys sat down and played amazing jazz music because it's a jazz based score. And so that's going to take a lot of work to be able to yeah. get that many people to be that well coordinated. Yeah, and uh, at, again, at the top of the profession, right. the, the coordination is all in the writing and the, the way that the score is written. But what you were saying about it that I think is interesting, you kind of tie that to consulting. People think yeah. you just drop these people, team members, in here right. and there unless they are that freaking amazing. And, and the, the whole that, team would have to be that amazing. So yeah, there's two things that those, well, there's many things those guys are, are amazing at, okay. right, and gals that are at the top of the studio profession. One, uh, they can sight read anything, mm -hmm. put any piece of music, and they can just read it as if they've been practicing. Uh, number two, they are amazing listeners. Okay, that's right? where I was gonna yeah. go next, it's good. Amazing listeners, right? Uh, so, uh, the top of the, the world as far as the performance on their instruments. So technically, right. best in the world ability to sight read, but then the listening part is the thing that pushed you over the top. Because they have to hold each other together and hold yeah. each other up and adjust it's, as needed. It's got to sound like they've rehearsed even yeah. when they have it. Okay. Yeah. What about with the smaller group? Because yeah. that, I kept thinking about the Miles Davis thing about its social music. Yeah. And when you're playing, even if you're really good, I mean, most of your job is listening to the other people, right? Exactly right. Yeah. And responding. Can you talk about that, like how that works for you a little bit? Yeah, and uh, one of the things that things that sets a really, really great jazz small group right. apart from people that are really good at their instruments and okay. have a really good jazz vocabulary, they can improvise well. The thing that sets those two groups apart is how they listen to each other. Okay. And there's a, we see this in the agile space as well, but there is a, a kind of a flavor of that, of musician that's really in it to show off. Right. You know, they're gonna play all their great licks and they're gonna sound amazing. But the, the rest of the people in the band are just like, eh, not yeah. that interesting, you know, that, uh, because they're not listening and it's, then it's not a collaborative effort anymore. It feels like... So one person yeah, can kind of kill the whole thing. It feels like there's one star and a supporting cast, and, and okay. that's no fun because that's not what the music's about. Now, when you're playing in a small group like that and the people are really good listeners, are you kind of... I just have it in my head that you're like pushing each other and trying to take each other different places. And totally. In the same way that if you are working with a team or coaching, like the social engineering aspects of that and push people to see what you can do. Yeah, and there's, uh, it's interesting because sometimes there's, a, it feels like a little bit of a push. More often it feels like We're an opening offering. a door for them, yeah. It's an offering, you know, like uh, the, the, especially in rhythm section players, the great rhythm section players right. uh, will, will just 
like throw something at you. Yeah. Be like, here's a cookie. What might you do with that? Yeah. And then uh, the and then the, and that's learning yeah. about each other too, right? It's testing yeah, each other's it's, boundaries. Here's and the here's the fascinating thing though. You get the best jazz improvisers in the world. Right. They can never have met. Sit down and immediately, boom, they're listening. Yeah. There's, it's a it's a listening skill, and one of the points I make in the session is that there's a, a, a hundred years of jazz tradition now. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's there's no there's no money in jazz music, and so the people that are in it are in it because they love the art. Yeah. And so uh, the the ones that are great at it uh, are just steeped in the tradition of jazz. Okay. And so there are tunes that everybody knows. Yeah. You, you know there are. Uh, they're kind of rules of the road. It's almost like there's a an unwritten working agreement, no okay. matter what, if you're playing with great jazz musicians. But in the same, I guess the corollary to maybe something like Scrum is we've got ceremonies, but it's what you do with that time together. Yeah. Like you might be doing a retrospective, there's hundreds of ways to do it, where are you gonna go with it? Yeah, exactly right. Okay. And and I think it's even it's even closer to uh, cultural rules. Yeah. Because in jazz those those rules aren't written down. Uh, they are talked about. Uh, especially for younger kids, you okay. know the, the the young lions, as they call them in, in the jazz world, that are coming up. Uh, they usually find a mentor who will sit them down and be like, "Look, man, you were just playing and playing all your licks. You weren't listening at all to the rest of the band. You can't do that, right?" And then right. and then the ones that are good, they they learn that. And then the next time they sit down and play with a group or sit in with a group, their ears are wide open. Okay. So there's a they're like these cultural rules more than uh, formal rules, like in a scrum framework. So. I want to ask a weird question, and you can totally shoot it down if you want, <laughs> cool. but um, you saw Whiplash. Yes. Okay. So would that be more, that kind of interaction, more like command and control, traditional waterfall? Because it was all about the ego of the band. The, uh, well, there are certainly egos in the industry. First off, that music had nothing to do with any kind of jazz education program, how it actually works. Right. Okay. Because... Uh, like anything, especially uh, playing the drums, playing the drums is the most athletic experience a musician can have. Right. Right. I've seen I've seen some studies on this that, you know, like a rock drummer playing a four-hour gig uh, burns as many calories as somebody running a marathon or something like wow. that. Right. It's crazy. Okay. Uh, and and so the the kind of athletic aspect of that is not at all what it's about. And especially since that was a jazz drummer. Right. Right. Um, what changes when you get to the the big band side of things? is that Big Band tries to mix structure with freedom. How so? So in, in a big band, 99% uh, of all big bands, everything is, uh, all, all the music is written out. Including the, the solos, is playing right? out Until you get to the solo. Okay. And then what happens is the, the improvisation happens over the form of the song, but nothing's written out there. Okay. Sometimes there will be like some background figures for the other for the rest of the band to play behind the solo. Right. Uh, but often, in, again, in really great big bands, uh, the background figures aren't necessarily written out. You know, the, the solo will be playing something cool, and we'll give somebody uh, in the section an idea, and they'll be like, "Hey, this dude." Uh, uh, right. Uh, 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 right. And and the whole band will just start improvising that background figure. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool. So. Um you're also doing, you, you, you did another talk, which I couldn't even find. A <laughs> secret private talk. It's just under the radar. And, and it's also something that you're focused on in the work that you're doing. Yeah. Right? Overcoming immunity to change. Uh-huh. So what was that session about? Uh, that session was about personal change, so it was a little bit of a departure from some of the other sessions at the conference where they're really about teams, organization, right. leadership, those kind of things. Uh, that session was about a model that was invented by uh, a couple of uh, researchers at Harvard. So okay. that's Lisa Leahy and Robert Keegan. Okay. And uh, Keegan, his research uh, kind of permeates a lot of the work that I do. He's, he's got a, an adult development model that's really okay. well researched and, and uh, really powerful. The particular session I gave uh, was about, uh, I'll give you one of the, the stories from sure. it, which is that uh, there, there's a study where they have uh, heart patients mm -hmm. that have been given like a, a, a really drastic diagnosis by their doctor. Basically, if you don't change your habits, you're going to die. You're going to die. Right. And when they ask those people receiving that diagnosis, uh, will you make the changes, of course they all say, well, yeah, of course I'm going to make the changes. And then they don't. Well, the, uh, one out of seven are able to do it. So why is it? And it's interesting because you think, well, you know, what, the six out of seven, they just didn't care? You know, like, no, of course not. They, they, right, they care. They, they want to see their kids graduate from high school and, yeah. you know, their grandkids and stuff. It's not that they don't care. Uh, 
And, and so the, the, the point of that study is that willpower doesn't work for changes okay. like that. Those changes are hard to make. And so what Keegan and Lady do is they dig into the psychology of that and it goes way back into kind of like how our brains evolved, which is okay. our brains evolved to survive, not to be happy. <laughs> okay. And survival, in an, from an evolutionary standpoint, meant that uh, anything new was scary. Right, okay. because if, if everything's cool and everything's cool, and then a lion pops up, you don't know. Yeah, you better be able to move like that. Uh, and so our brains are basically tuned in for anything that is new. Okay. And uh, new equals scary to us. Okay. A threat. It's all su it's all subconscious though. We're not aware of it. Right. And so what uh, what they've done is they've done a, a really simple tool that's got four columns in it. Okay. And you pick some big goal. And so for the heart patients, it would be like. I'm going to eat healthy and uh, exercise once a day. Okay. Uh, and then the, that's the first column. And the second column, you just write all of the behaviors that you have right now that are the opposite of that. What do you do okay. now and not do? And so, you know, and they say, well, you know, I eat burgers a lot or I eat fast food and, uh, you know, I, I never exercise. And you write all those things. You get into the third column and there's a box right at the top of it. It's, it's called the worry box. Okay. And the way the worry box works is, uh, you, you, you like vividly visualize yourself doing the opposite of all of those column two behaviors. So doing the good thing. Doing the good thing. So okay. you, you vividly imagine yourself uh, getting up in the morning and putting on your running shoes and going out and jogging and then doing it again the next day and again the next day and again the next day. You vividly visualize yourself saying no to the fast food and preparing some vegetables and okay. some healthy food. And uh, if it's a meaningful change like that that you've struggled with, uh, you will start to freak out because you're triggering all those amygdala, yeah. that, right? all those things that, that cause you to not do it start to get triggered. You write down, what would you be afraid of if you did that? Okay. And Keegan gives an example of that where people have a hard time doing that. So Keegan gives an example where he was talking to one of those heart patients and, and the thing that that person was supposed to do was to take his medication every day. Okay. Pretty simple. A year later, he wasn't doing it. And so he's working through this immunity mapping process. Uh, and and he says, all right, so what would you be worried about? What are your fears? The guy couldn't even talk about the fears. He said, oh, uh, I'd be worried uh, that um, uh, if I don't do it, I'll die. The king said, no, no, no. What if you do do it? What if you do do it, right? And the guy suddenly got all animated. He said, I'm not an old man. My dad's an old man. He's in the nursing home, and nobody ever visits him, and I'm not old. Right. And so, boom, it's like, we So the worry is that he has it. to acknowledge that he's maybe that old he's old. or weak or what, yeah. got a weakness or whatever. Wow. Yeah, or, or just that he's getting so old. So it doesn't even have to be something that is like logical or makes sense. Exactly. It's just your emotional re response. It's your emotional response. Okay. And then those things point us to what, what Keegan calls hidden competing commitments. Okay. That guy was committed to living the life of a, of a young man. Yeah. To you know, kind of having freedom to do whatever he wants, and I can eat whatever I want. He yeah. was committed to the idea of I I want to be young. Okay, it's not a bad commitment. It's not a bad right. thing, right? Uh, and uh, and then once you get those hidden competing commitments, that shows you that's the thing that's holding you back. He calls that your immune system. It's your psychological immune system. You're immune to change because the of the belief that. that you're stuck on. Yeah, and it's and and even and if logic hidden. is saying the opposite, you can't let yeah. go of it anyway. Until you go through the process, it's always been hidden until okay. then. Because he, he never would have voiced that if you said, hey, why don't you take your medicine? Yeah, he probably say, couldn't oh, even find you know, it. Uh, yeah, I forget to, uh, forget to pick up my prescription, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Not going to see it. But once you talk about the worry box, that's like the, that's like the little can opener into your psychology. Have you done this with organizations? Yeah, I've done it with organizations. I've done it very frequently with individual leaders okay. in organizations. It's always very powerful. Uh, I, I recently did one with a, a CEO and her team. Right. Uh, and the way that we did it is uh, we start with individual. Okay. Everybody does one individually. Uh, and in, in, in that situation, it was very much like doing it in a session where I'm explaining what the column is, I'm giving yeah. them some examples, and then they do their part, and then they do their part. And then we get to the end of it, and I asked uh, if people would be willing to share that. And everybody opted into sharing. That's cool. And so they paired up with the person next to them, and they shared. They walked all the way through it. Okay. And uh, it got really emotional at that point because the they're all really vulnerable. All really vulnerable. These are really meaningful changes. You have to admit that you're not perfect to right. do that. And uh, at the end of that session, they all asked, you know, 
how can we help you with your okay. change goal? And some That's people cool. was like, hey, just could you follow up with me in a couple of weeks and make sure like I get be my this, accountability partner, accountability partner, yeah. all kinds of things. So the trust on that team went ooh, like through the roof by okay. the time we were through that. Now, does that prime them to be able to think about the company together? Yeah. And, and so then what we can do is move into a group one. And so okay. as a group, what's the one big thing that we could change how we function as a group? And now that they, they kind of have some experience with it, you know, what do we do yeah. or not do related to that? Wow. What would we be worried about? Okay. So it's been really powerful, and it's it's kind of funny because there's like this ironic link between the two sessions. Yeah. Uh, when I first read about the immunity map, uh, the the big change that I wanted to make was being more focused. Okay. Okay. Felt like you know I'm, I'm all over the place. I'm not focused on. <laughs> you do not strike me as somebody who's all over the place in any way. All over the place means I'm I'm doing everything. Okay. Right. And at the and at that time I was playing, you know, six to eight times a month. Okay. And I was doing classes. I was doing coaching engagements. You know. Uh, and I worked my way through it, and I got to the end of it, and uh, what I realized my my hidden competing commitment was was. Uh, being great at everything I do, which right. is not a bad commitment. Right. And as I kind of started doing like almost a root cause, like you do, you can do some five whys on those. Sure. Like, well, why does that matter to me? Uh, we didn't get to the fourth column, which is my uh, my big assumptions. Okay. Usually, there's some assumption that I can't do the change and meet those competing commitments. Correct. Right. right. That's the assumption. And so then, at the end of it, we come up with tests, experiments. How can we test to see if that assumption is true this or not? Is really cool. The thing that I got that, that that was really powerful for me was if I'm not playing music full time, right. I'm not fulfilling my destiny. I won't be happy on earth, right? Okay. So here was the test that I ran. Uh, I said, all right, I'm going to test that by, for two weeks, every call that comes in to do a gig on the trumpet, I'm going to say no. And I'm going to see how it feels. Now that's a probably a, a riskier emotionally well, test than most people would be willing to run. What's funny about <laughs> you saying this, and like, because I'm doing kind of a similar experiment, yeah. and, and I just interviewed Lisa about yeah. not doing as much. Yeah. For people in our field, it's like, other people, I want to do more, we're all like, <laughs> yeah, it's full. We got to do less <laughs> stuff yeah. Yeah. so we can enjoy the things. But is part of the thing that's driving the music, like, Kind of a hangover from when you were a kid growing up. I want to be a musician. Yeah. Now you're working in technology. Yeah. Are you betraying that goal? Yeah. And that was that was uh, one of the questions I had as I filled out the map. Like uh, one of the worries in my worry box was I just wasted 30 years of my life. Wow. Okay. So it can get pretty deep, right? And that's why sometimes yeah. it gets it gets pretty emotional. So when you're doing that in a team. But really even the way that you phrase that, I mean, that that is a very telling thing too. It's, yeah. it's not that I won't be a great musician or I won't have all these gigs, I won't get the opportunities. That was on there too. But. Okay. Well, but but yeah. it's, it's it, it got deeper, right? Yeah. So the the story is, I, I get a call the next day. Yeah. And the call was to play with one of those LA big bands. A call that I'd never got. It's a level above what I'd ever played before. Right. And? Which is kind of the dream yeah. sequence, right, for, for a musician. So we get to the, I get that call and I'm like, oh, come on. That's the call that's got to come in the next two weeks? Did you turn it down? And I turned it down. Oh, man. And here's, it was a fascinating thing. I hung up the phone and I almost literally cried. I, I get an emotional thing about it right yeah. now. I had this lightness, like a sense of peace. Like I, and, and then my very next thought was, I'm gonna hang out with my kids on Saturday instead yeah. of going That's, doing that it's gig. It's a gift to yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, experiment, validate yeah. it, right? Yeah. It and was, even though it, it might be like a rare thing, at the end of your life, skipping that gig is not gonna be as important as the time you spend no. with your kids. Yeah. That's awesome. Man. So it was really cool. So it was really powerful for me, and that's why I was so excited about sharing yeah. the tool. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's cool that you're able to use it for yourself and share it with other yeah. people. That's, that's kind of my pattern. Like, okay. you know, I, I find something that works. I get excited about it. I want everybody else to know about it, too. It's like, hey, here's something that works. That was my history with Scrum. Wow. We used it on our team. I was like, hey, this yeah. thing's so cool. You guys should 
come check this out. And then other teams in our organization started checking it out. Right. And, yeah. Well, if people want to learn about the tool, uh -huh. I mean, is this stuff that you've got available online or anything like that? Yeah, well, it's really Keegan and Leahy's tool, so I want to honor that. And, and uh, the best way to learn about it is they've, they've written a book called Immunity to Change. Okay. That, that goes through all the, you know, the psychology behind it and how it works. And it's also in another book that I often give out at my certified agile leadership class okay. called uh, An Everyone Culture. Okay. And, and that's like some uh, case studies of various organizations that take a, what they call a deliberately developmental approach okay. uh, to running their organization where they realize that human development yeah. is not separate. It's not like a function. It is like the key business thing that you yeah. can do to be more successful. Okay. Uh, and so they're telling all these cool stories in that book and then they say, and... Here's a tool. Yeah, there's like a chapter So do you use the tool in your leadership class? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we should mention where you work. I work with Agile for All. Okay. Yeah. And you teach certified Agile leadership yeah. classes. And you're doing CSM and CSPO stuff? Yeah, doing uh, uh, CSM and CSPO not as, not as often. I still do okay. them here in San Diego and... Uh, and we also just launched our advanced CSPO program, which okay. is really exciting. It's uh, they, they've they've made the format a little more flexible as right. long as you're meeting the learning objectives. And so the way we're running that class is we're doing agile learning. <laughs> Go okay. figure. Uh, so instead of doing two days, boom, just dump the bucket down on on the students. Um, there's some pre-work that's all online that okay. they do, and that's to make sure that coming into an advanced class, everybody's They're got the same foundation, yeah. right? Uh, and then. The way the class works is they're 90 minute Zoom web calls. Okay. And uh, Richard Lawrence and I will, will introduce a topic or two, uh, we'll walk through it, we'll do some exercise with it, and then we give them homework to go and use that tool with their team that week. Okay. And then they go online and they submit it and they answer a few questions. And the cool thing is, I didn't expect this part of it. Uh, I expected we'd grade it, we'd move on to that. Maybe like 15 minutes at the beginning of the next session we talk about it. Right. What's happened is during the homework, people are submitting their homework early and earlier because they realize when they when they upload the, uh, a lean canvas or something like that and ask some questions, we actually respond to them during the week. So and they so can like, expect and adapt all They're doing now. it during the week and they're, they're then they're like actually practicing and learning. That's awesome. It's so cool, man. So there, it's a six week program and, and the format of it, we're just really jazzed about it. It's right. working great. That's cool. So yeah. they can go to Agile for All to find out about the classes. That's right. And on the Twitter, TPT Man. TPT Man, Trumpet Man. All right. Yeah. Cool. Dude, thanks a lot. This is really Absolutely. Great. Thanks for great to see you. Keep watching. We got a couple more interviews tonight. We'll be doing them all day tomorrow here at Agile 2018.